This Week in Startups is brought to you by EquityZen, the premier marketplace allowing private investors to access proven startups. Head to EquityZen.com slash twist now to get started for free and get your minimum first investment cut in half. Walker Corporate Law, specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit WalkerCorporateLaw.com. And Salesforce Essentials. Jumpstart sales and support by leveraging the world's number one CRM at a startup price point at just $25 a month per user. Go to salesforce.com slash twist for an additional 50% off and a free onboarding call. Hey everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups, our topic today, self driving cars, autonomous robo-fleets. When are they coming? When will they be here? Well, my guest today, James Peng, is the co-founder and CEO of Pony.ai, which is one of the recent uh, unicorn members of the Unicorn Club here in California. Welcome to the program, James. Thank you, Jason. So uh, tell me about your company, Pony.ai. What do you do? Uh, Pony AI was, uh, we founded it at the end of uh, 2016. Uh, we focused on developing level four, level five autonomous driving technology and eventually uh, running a autonomous driving fleet to provide rides to all the passengers. Got it. So you want to kill my number one investment, Uber. Got it. Not okay. kill. Collaborate. Not collaborate. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, to find for everybody, you said level four and level five autonomy. For people who don't know what that is, explain what level four and level five are. Sure. Uh, so, the for the for the vehicle, the autonomy was divided into different levels. You can think of uh, uh, level one is a very simple, say say your cruise control. Okay. Level so we two, have level one now. You have level one. Level two, we have it like uh, Tesla's autopilot is sort of level two. You can in a confined environment, you can uh, let the vehicle drive, but you supervise. Yeah. Right. So you still have to have your hands on the wheel. You're giving multiple functions over in level two, like... Um, yeah, like adaptive cruise control. Right. Uh, Which means I, if the car in front of me slows down, I'll slow down proportionally, but exactly. try to hit my optimal speed as set in my cruise control. You, you can even notify it to do a lane, lane change. Right. Um, and so I use that every day, uh, the autopilot. Yeah. It's great. That's level two. But level two requires that I have the same uh, commitment to driving as if I didn't have any self-driving techniques on the car, right? Exactly. Essentially, it's still the safety responsibility is still up to the driver. The same. You cannot be on your phone texting, et cetera. Exactly. Okay, so now we get to level three. It gets interesting. Le level three, then it's in certain situations, you can completely be off the driving wheel. Oh. And then in certain, some other conditions, then you driving. Got For it. example, in a highway, you instead of like a, a typical autopilot, you can completely off the wheel and, and start looking at your phone. Got it. So level three, we do not have in the United States yet, correct? It's not uh, widely uh, used yet, but there are some prototypes and there's, there are certain products out there already. That are in private beta? I can't use them as a consumer. Not yet. So that's Waymo when they're driving... Or uh, Uber's no, cars? No, no, not yet. They're, they're, no, they're, they're level four. They're level four? Yeah. Okay, so level four is? So level four is in s most of the areas, you will be able to drive completely without a human intervention. Got it. Uh, so level three is in some areas, I can use my phone and not pay attention and self-driving. Level four, all areas. Not all areas, most of the areas. Most you, of the you areas. predefined defined areas. Got it. You can completely off the wheel. Got it. A level five means everywhere. Everywhere. Level five means um, I do, I, we don't even have a map. There's no GPS of this location, but the car will know what to do. If I put it on a private road, it would just work. Supposedly. W all weather condition, all geolocations. Okay. So you're supposed to just do it. Basically be as good as a human. An yes. alert human. Or, or better than or a human. Or better than a human, uh, obviously, because they wouldn't make mistakes. So you're attempting level four or level five. Level four, level three will be wonderful because people on highways will not have to text and drive. They'll be able to text or sleep. That's going to be a huge game changer. When is level three 
going to happen for, let's say, Tesla's autopilot or anybody else's, Volvo's, uh, here in California or America, do you think? Consumers will be able to sleep on the highway or do uh, texting. Yes. I think the, with the current technology continue to advance and uh, the safety level goes several notch up, mm. probably in, in three to five years. Okay. We'll, we'll be able to do, to have actually consumer product, consumer vehicles that be able to provide level three out there. Wow. So in as few as three, four or five years, Yes. On the 280, on the 101, we might be able to, hey, do your email. Or if you're stuck in traffic, it's not that big of a deal because you can watch a movie. Yes. And the vehicle actually will notify you if you say something dangerous and, and let you take it over. And who is driving this? Is it the industry? Is it companies like yours, Pony AI and Tesla and Waymo? Is it the government? I think Who's right now driving it. I think right now it's so mostly the the private private companies that's driving driving the uh, because the thing that we do see the market out there. We do see the huge benefit and mm -hmm. the potential uh, benefits to to all the society. And does the government agree with this framework? The level one, two, three, four, or five? Did they come up with that? Or? Uh, yeah, it, it's come out from the uh, from the highway uh, authority. Got it. And so. Do you get the sense that the government is very pro this innovation happening, uh, or are they concerned? Uh, Where do you think the government sits on that? Because we're all very enthusiastic. We believe that this will save lives ultimately. What does the government believe? Do they have a lot at risk and they're conservative, or are they aggressively want to see this future? Well, <clears throat> apparently, I don't have a complete picture yet, mm. but it's so far from our my personal experience, I think most most the government agencies that we deal with, it's it's very uh, cautiously optimistic. Right. So they they will they will let it out a little bit, see what happens. If they if all the companies showed safe track record, I mm. think they'll open a bit more. Okay. So that's certainly the case for California. Let's take a look at a video here. You brought some video of your. Um, product in market. Now you're adding your technology to existing cars. You're not making your own Teslas. Like Waymo, or actually Waymo makes their own cars now. Are you making your own cars or you're adding your technology to cars uh, that exist in the market? Actually, same as Waymo, we are not making the vehicles yet. Mm -hmm. We're retrofitting an existing vehicle by putting the sensors mm. and also developing advanced AI algorithms. So that to make the vehicles fully be able to handle all the traffic scenarios by itself. Got it. So this is level four. What do you four. use, Prius, Volvo? Uh, this one is a Lincoln MKZ. Lincoln. Oh, okay. okay. So like the uh, ones you would get picked up in an Uber Black. Yeah. Let's take a look. So yeah, here we so, go. So, so this is the level four, meaning that there's no human intervention. And then this is the, in the urban scenarios. Okay. So urban that, scenarios, level four. So let's Pony take a look. AI. Uh, this is a, a mix of clips. So this is uh, uh, um, doing in a busy road, doing an unprotected left turn means there's no light, no left turn lights. You have to yield the incoming traffic from the other side before you can make And this is turn. not America because I can the, see the way yeah. people are driving this is and the way people are busy, crossing. Busy road in Beijing and you have to wait for the motorcycles and pedestrians. Before the motorcycles can... driving the pedestrian <laughs> crosswalk you're referring to. <laughs> yeah. And, and then- Just this... take a pause here for a second. I have a question for you. In China, uh, do people jaywalk like this still? And are the are roads still very dangerous? Because I haven't been to mainland China in 10 uh, years. And it was crazy when I was there. People were making left turns a hundred feet, two hundred feet before the intersection to try to get a jump on the tra oncoming traffic. It was terrorizing. It, uh, I, I that would definitely say it's a lot better now, but okay. we still have this once in a while. Uh, to make the car safe means we have to handle all the extreme cases, ah. regardless whether it's a it's a once in a million or once in a ten situation. We still have to handle it. So, the driving conditions in a major city in China are how much more challenging than, say, San Francisco or New York? Uh, 
I'll say equal, at least the equally challenging. Okay, because it seems more challenging if people are driving motorcycles on the crosswalks. I mean, I don't, I don't even see that in New York. <laughs> but San Francisco has a lot of pedestrians to deal with. Too. That's true too. But uh, jay workers, jay there are jaywalkers here. Yeah, is part of the solution going to be that? We're going to have to get pedestrians to behave differently, like put them into pens and, you know, put fences up like I see some places in Hong Kong where they, or in some areas of New York now, they've put fences so people can't jaywalk. Is that part of the solution to all this, do you think? That definitely will increase the safety. But as a technology player, our job is to make it safe regardless what's surrounding okay. traffic out there. All right, let's keep watching here. All right, rush hour we saw, um, and you made that left turn very elegantly, and you didn't kill any of the pedestrians or the motorcycles. Okay. Congratulations. So, thank you. So the next one we show is uh, um, the case of uh, dynamic lane change. How you can notice on the left side, the blue line is the one we, uh, the, the path that we will take. You can see we try to make a left turn, but because there's uh, incoming traffic on the adjacent lane, we opportunistically choose the place where we make mm. the turn. Got it. And that was a pretty aggressive lane change there. Yeah. When I'm using my autopilot on my- This uh, is a rainy days. Yeah, rainy day here. Very heavy rain. Uh, I mean, that looks like a tropical storm. Here yes. we have two trucks that- Two big trucks notify on the left side, how we sweep to the left a little bit to keep the distance from the right truck. Right. And then we sweep to the right to keep distance All to the right. All while staying in your lane. Exactly. Just to be clear. Just to sweep a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Here up, you are going underneath, uh, a highway, underneath a highway, whipping around a turn at about 30 and, and, and miles an hour. And the pedestrian is, is minding his own business out no, of nowhere. That pedestrian is walking in the middle of the street trying to commit suicide, I think is what you're saying. Yeah. Here's a bunch of school kids running in front of because traffic. We're, we're, we're driving what right is along going on elementary in school. Oh my Lord. It's elementary school right there. You have to yield them be, uh, before you can Where drive. are the teachers? What is going on in China? Is well, it, I guess it's out of school. <laughs> oh my God. I, it really is amazing to me, I guess. Um, when we were in New York, we would jaywalk a lot, but this is a level of jaywalking in China that I, I it just seems crazy. It, it, those children ro crossing against the light on their own? Yeah, because th th that's actually a school zone. So they actually allowed, you see what's uh, marked? On the, on, on, on the sidewalk, on the, street, the markings on the sidewalk. They're, they're marking, so, so they actually- so Oh, they're allowed we, to run in front of traffic. Yeah, we have to notify, we have to notice it Recognize it oh and avoid the, avoid any accidents. All right. When we get back, I want to get your estimate on when. Level four. You said level three, three to five years. Now level four, which is, hey, that's when you're going to really be competitive and maybe be selling uh, some really cool equipment and cars to uh, our friends at Lyft and Uber when we get back on This Week in Startups. Have you ever wondered how to get on the cap table and buy and sell shares in private companies? I'm sure you have. Well, there's an easy place to do that right now. It's called Equity Zen. Equity, E Q U I T Y Zen, Z E N. And Equity Zen is a premier online marketplace where you can invest in private tech companies backed by top tier venture capital firms and angel investors like me, okay? And you can do it long before the IPO. Equity Zen is also for shareholders who want to get a little liquidity. Maybe you've been working at a company like Robinhood or previously Lyft and Uber, and you want to just get a little liquidity before those companies go public, Facebook, et cetera. Well, you can sell some of your shares on Equity Zen and get cash and help out the private investors who are trying to get shares in these coveted, world-changing companies. Some examples of companies that are available right now on Equity Zen before they IPO'd include Spotify, Sonos, Glassdoor, MongoDB, Cloudera, and PillPack. All of these companies did exceptionally well. I was able to use this a couple times in my career. I sold a little bit of my Calm in a secondary. I sold a little bit of my Uber in a secondary. It's a great idea if you're an angel investor or a shareholder in these companies, maybe to sell 10%, 20% of your position as they grow. So, you know, listen, you can dollar cost average and it's great for private uh, investors who want exposure to this area to buy a little bit of those shares. Go to equityzen.com slash twist. And for twist fans only, Equity Zen is offering half the minimum investment. That's right. You can now invest just 10K as opposed to the previous minimum of 20K, but only if you go to this URL, equityzen.com slash twist. So you can dip your toe, you can get your feet wet, you can get your beak wet. Just for a taste, this is for uh, people who 
obviously are investors, you know there's risk involved, but hey, no risk, no reward. That's the story of my life. Thanks again to Equity Zen for supporting my podcast and for lowering the minimum so people can get a taste. EquityZen.com slash twist, EquityZen.com slash twist. Let's get back to this amazing episode of Twist. Hey everybody, welcome back. My guest today, James Pang, he is the co-founder and CEO of Pony.ai. Previously, you were at Baidu, and before that, uh, Google, is that right? That's right. What did you do at Google? Um, I was working mostly on the infrastructure side, uh, oh. ad, ads backend. The, the ads backend? Advertisement, the, the ads, so you, AdWords, ads, ad, AdSense, the backend system. Got it. So you were figuring out how to get people to click on ads and make 17 cents, and now you're figuring out how to not kill people who are jaywalking in the streets of Beijing. That That's a good summary. Wow. Um, so not being facetious here, and I know I had another question I was going to ask you, is the background that you learned at Google and the internet, uh, revolution, how did the internet and the mobile revolution lead to this self-driving revolution? One of the key challenge for the autonomous driving is how do you efficiently handle that huge amounts of data because all the sensors in the vehicle collects all the surrounding information. Mm. So so in that regard, how do you design a system that can efficiently process all the data, extract useful information from the data? I think all those are, are, are backgrounds are very interconnected. Yeah, so if you were going to index the world's information and allow people to search for their favorite book or comic book character and then instantly give them an answer you have to take you have to have some tool to take a bunch of inputs which would be web crawlers or in this case with self-driving the inputs are cameras put that data into a database or into some sort of framework and then make sense out of it with an algorithm google made sense of web pages and documents and images and videos you're making sense of videos and cameras, and I'm assuming LIDAR, LIDAR in the real well. world. Yes. Um, so essentially, self-driving is the Google search engine at play in real time, indexing the world. Index the world around you. The world around you, yes. Not the yeah. entire world. No, yeah. But in a way, we will have almost the entire world if all these cars and all these phones were actually indexing it. It's kind of interesting to think about. We'd have the entire simulation in another simulation. That's so right. You build a simulation of the simulation world. You think we're living in a simulation right now? You know this theory, simulation. Yeah, yeah, theory? sure, sure, of course. What do you think the percentage is that this is a simulation right now? That a you and simulation I, of a simulation. Yeah. Or a simulation that you're making a simulation of a simulation that you don't know you're in a simulation. What do you think the chances of that are? Is so, it zero? So, so far, I'm not a believer of that, but. Nothing's zero, so I don't know. Yeah, but exactly. I would say very slim. <laughs> very slim. <laughs> uh, all right. A and in a way, if we hadn't had the graphics cards um, and the sensors that mobile phones brought and video games brought, we would never have gotten the ability to process this amount of data, would we? No. When the first Waymo cars came out, the cost of that sensor array, I think it was almost 10 years ago now that they started, 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is it was over $100,000 for all the LiDAR and sensors. Is that ballpark uh, correct? Used to be more than that. 150 or something? Yeah. yeah. What is? What do you have it down to now? What is the industry? Because you're a LiDAR solution, not a camera-based solution like Tesla. We'll get into that. What is your package of sensors cost today? What will it cost in five years to outfit a car? Uh, now it's already halved. So we're, 75. We're, we're about 70. Uh, everything, including all the sensors, computer, uh, graphics card, everything. Yeah. I mean, everything uh, when we put in the vehicle. And the computer and, that's and in that vehicle would be the same as the highest end video game machine or more? It's actually less. We're, less. We're, we're, what we're always trying to do is to optimize the whole system. Mm. So we've actually put in not too powerful of a computer because the thing that if you put too much too powerful of a computer that means you draw too much power ah. from the vehicle you reduce the range ah. you reduce the stability of the vehicle got it okay and so that's only a couple of thousand what is all the other cost then what is the 70,000 breakdown into today uh it's sensors will be be a 
maybe 60-70% of oh, the wow. total cost. And what kind of uh, sensors are there and how many? Uh, we have, uh, it's the center main LiDAR, uh, hmm. 32 line LiDAR, that's that's about 20-22-ish. Got it. Uh, so that's the uh, big piece. Is that's that, the big piece. That's that big circle people see on top that's spinning. Uh, no, we have a smaller one, smaller not, not one. The, the 64 old big one. Right. It's much smaller, uh, but it's still, we're not purchasing by bulk. Ah. So so the, the price is still relatively high. Five years, what will it be down to? Two My guess. prediction with so many companies start working on this, yeah. as so many startups and companies start manufacturing the, the LiDAR, I'll say in, in, easily in three, five years, we're going to be half again, easily. Wow. And- $35,000 seems like a lot until you realize that these cars could run almost all day long, probably 18 hours a day. Uh, so it would be the equivalent of having three full-time people working or four full-time people working around the, you know, working full-time for, and then you could amortize that cost over what would be the life cycle, five, 10 years, something to that effect. Not even less than that, right? You think about the, uh, yeah. if it's even single driver, you amortize it. it the payback most, period would be yeah. months. It'd be under a year. Yeah, well, under, under a year. year. Yeah. Uh, so when I went to commercial break with you, I was asking you, when do you think level four, let's pick um, a city of note, Beijing, San Francisco, Los Angeles, you pick the city. Um, when do you think that will occur? This is the hard question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think the... And take me through your thinking of path to yeah. commercialization. Yeah, we'll take a step by step approach. Got it. So uh, we'll get to that level three. We'll, we'll, we'll get to not level three, level four. As I mentioned already, level four is without human intervention driving in certain areas. Right. For example, in, in the Silicon Valley, in, in Mountainville, in Sunnyvale, in those areas, probably will be able to completely handle them in five years. Got it. Uh, then we start maturing, start learning, and and also making the uh, mass production even better. So go, then probably another three, five years go into so you see cities like in, San Francisco. Got it. So you see working in small towns where you can define the problem set in a very narrow way. Exactly. And why is that so much easier? I mean, we're watching you drive through Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou. Why is that going to be the path? Because it will just be people. Because is that because of human nature? People are conservative and they want to see it work. No, it's because it's like how you uh, prepare for the test, right? Mm. You you do hard problems. You want yeah. to do practice on much harder problems. Ah. But when during the test, if you want a perfect score, you want the test problems to be easier. Got it. Right. Now we 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 can handle San Francisco. We can handle New York. We can handle Beijing. Right. But not perfectly. Got it. But going there will help us to make uh, handling suburban area much faster. Hmm. So it's a f it, you're forcing yourself to solve the hardest problem, and then you'll go back to easier problems after that. Exactly. Got so it. that you can get perfect score in your test. Right. And Mountain View, there's going to be less pedestrians. You're, if there's a construction site or something changes, you'll know about it. Exactly. Very quickly. Um, and so it'll be very easy to do, but you could also have a safety driver in there. Are, is anybody doing tests without safety drivers right now? Is the Waymo test, there's a Waymo test in Arizona, well, right? Waymo has a small scale testing without a safety driver. In Arizona. In Arizona. And they're using minivans. And how is that going to the best of your knowledge? What has the reporting on it been? Because it's public, the reporting on it. I, I think so far, it's at least it's it's a perfect safety uh, track record. Nobody's been killed. Um, have there been instances where remote people have had to take over? Because they have a remote person watching each car. Is that correct? No, no, not. It, it's like a remote person watching a, bunch, a fleet of vehicles. Got it. So there's one person at a desk somewhere watching 10 cars at the same time and watching the video of it. Is that live streaming? Yeah. Live streaming it. Yeah. And if there's an issue with one, they can take over and drive it? Not drive it, to lead to safety. To lead it to safety. For example, uh, if it's a construction that the vehicle was not able to recognize it, mm. then the one behind the desk can give it an instruction to, to bypass it. Really? Yeah. Wow. They can see a route around it. Or they can pull the car over and then send somebody out. Exactly. Have there 
they have to document all the times that occurs, right? And publish it every year. All the data from all these safety has to be safety trials have to be published, right? Uh, that's the law in California. <clears throat> I'm not uh, sure if that's the one in Arizona. Got it. So, what do you think when we get back from this uh, break? I want to know what bet you're making as a business now. Because it feels like there are four or five players who are very close to level three and four and have p different ranges of pilots and tests going on. What is going to be the business here? Will it all, as some people have told me, be commoditized and everybody will have access to the technology at about the same time? So then Uber, Lyft, and other services will have it at the same time. Or do you believe that someone like Tesla... Elon claims he's going to have next year his own fleet out there and he's going to kill Uber and Lyft and have half price or one third price. Or is he going to win when we get back on This Week in Startups? Thanks again to the Walker Corporate Law Group, a boutique law firm specializing in startups for supporting This Week in Startups for a decade. Thank you, Scott. From me, Jason Calacanis, to you, Scott Walker. Thank you not only for supporting the program, but for supporting all the startups I've sent to you over the years. You know the Walker Corporate Law encourages fixed fees. They believe billable hours are inefficient, and they will give you a fixed fee so that when you get that bill at the end of the month, boom, you know what you're going to pay. You're not going to have that sticker shock when you open the PDF. Additional services, mergers and acquisitions, licensing arrangements, terms of service, privacy policies, all that stuff that you need to do to make sure your startup is protected and done right. And their lawyers have decades of experience, 10, 20 years or more. There are no junior associates getting on the job training with your startup. So if you want to talk to the founder himself, Scott Ed Walker, go directly to walkercorporatelaw.com or email scott at walkercorporatelaw.com. Scott at walkercorporatelaw.com or call 415-979-9998. 415-979-9998. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, we're talking about self-driving with somebody who's working on it every day and has raised $264 million, Is that correct? That's right. And you're valued at over a billion? $1.7. $1.7 billion for Pony.ai. You have offices here and also in China? That's right. Are you a Chinese company, an American company? A global company. But a global we, company. We started in the uh, Bay Area, okay. but we expanded into China. Got it. And so what is the regulatory framework in China like? for self-driving, and do you hope to play in it there? Uh, I think s s similarly, as I mentioned, it's uh, cautiously optimistic. So, so the regulation opens a little bit. For example, uh, several big cities come up with regulations for autonomous driving testing. Hmm. Then you can apply for license. Once you get the license, you, you're, about, uh, you're allowed to, to do the open road testing. Uh, but you have to have a dri safety driver. You still have to have a dri safety driver. Should there be two safety drivers? Because th there was a horrible accident uh, that Uber was involved in where somebody was jaywalking in the middle of a street. They were obviously at fault. And then also at fault, the driver who was looking down at their phone and there was only one safety driver. So the technology was at fault. The safety driver's at fault. The pedestrian's at fault. You have a triple fault going on here, um, which is typically how errors happen, right? With computers, you have multiple or when an airplane or some complex system fails, it's usually multiple people at fault. Should there always be a second safety driver in there so that the first person doesn't or feels the social pressure to not look at their phone? Because what they found was when there was two, one person was taking notes, one person was prepared to take over. The You didn't have this issue of people going and playing Candy Crush or looking at Twitter or, or texting. I think it's like anything else. It always has the very small probability of failure. Mm. So I think the, to start with, the autonomous driving system within the vehicle needs a backup system. Sure. It's, so sure. two computers. It at least has a one main computer and, and a backup computer. Uh, two sets of different sensors. Ah. Uh, maybe the backup system does not need to be as powerful as the main system. Got it. But it at least can do the safety job. Uh, um, so if the main system is at fault, the other system could pull you over or tell oh, you to take over. Exactly. Ah, so you have to build, uh, you have to duplicate every system. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say it's duplicate, but make, make a much smaller system, but... Redundant. As a redundant. Got it. 
So it's not like a RAID array where you have to have the same exact hardware profile because that would get awfully expensive. What happens if the LiDAR breaks up top? But then you still have other sensors that can- The other camera sensors would can, do it. Can allow you to actually safely pull over. I think that needs to be put in place Got instead it. of uh, two drivers because that, then that defeats all the purpose of going for yeah. autonomous. Yeah. Did you look at that instance where Uber had the fatality and what was your assessment of that? Well, I think your assessment was absolutely right. It's it's the th some th three things went wrong at least. At least, and, and yeah. then it's, it's we a, a very unfortunate event. What was the fault of the self driving technology? Was that ever unpacked or explained? I haven't seen an update on that because something uh, went wrong with the self driving technology that it didn't see the person in that low light, which its lidar is supposed to see at night. This was a completely dark street, right? It was between street lamps or something, and they have video of it. Uh, um, I, Of course, without knowing all the nitty-gritty details, yeah. uh, it's hard to make the, the mm. right assessment. Yeah. But, but something must went wrong. Otherwise, the, the cars should suppose, supposedly should make a, a stop. Got it. What is your business model? How are you going to make money, do you think? Or you're going to push that out and figure it out once you get the technology done? No, we, we, we start start as a stage to needs to figure it out. Of course, we, we iterate and try to change it as we go. We, we start with by working with the car manufacturers. So it's sort of like a licensing model mm. because the thing that um, sub, sub, the, as the stakeholder in the mobility business, the, all the OEMs, the car manufacturers, they need to uh, uh, own or at least to know this technology. Uh, so, so I think licensing definitely is a very valid re revenue stream. Yeah. Uh, the other is, as you said, it's it's to own the fleet hmm. and to use it as a robot taxi. What do you think of Elon's claim that next year he will have a robo taxi fleet in a city in America, up and running? Depends on the scale, but I I, I think next year probably is a bit too aggressive. Okay, uh, but some some point I think we will. Two, you said three to five years was we'll, your we'll, estimate. We'll, we'll have certain, maybe in the in the order of thousands, uh, thousands of cars on the road somewhere. Yeah. Will those cars have safety drivers or not? We're talking about real uh, autonomous. That so not, not no safety drivers. No. I, I think with the safety driver, it's already out there. Right. So yeah, because Waymo has it without the safety driver. So. He believes, or he said that a couple of months ago. So he believed he needed, let's call it 20 months. You believe 36 to 50 months or something is the proper estimate, maybe. So you, he, he's probably a year more aggressive. Uh, if you are average in aggressiveness in terms of your estimate, which I think you are, he's probably being a year more aggressive. But it's possible in small cities, small deployments uh, to do this. I think it could be. Yeah. And you just geofence it and the cars won't be able to leave that area. That seems to me to be a very likely scenario. That, that, that most likely will be the scenario. And if that happens, what will that do to public transportation? Would there be a need for public transportation? And do you see governments becoming the group that then provides the service? Because what would be the need of buses if we had, buses right now cost $2 or something. And right now, Ubers and Lyfts cost four or five dollars, typically six or seven. What's the point of even having a bus if people could take point to point and it was self-driving and everybody could have their own driver? No, I think it, different modes of transportation serve its own need, right? Yeah. The uh, well, even buses can be autonomous. That's true too. Right, and, and yeah. then there are subways. As subways take you to a longer route. Yeah, I'm just thinking specifically about buses. Like buses are, people have to transfer and then walk in between them. It just seems like... But, but it's a much... See, see the thing that why the ridership of buses are not very high because it's not convenient and also right. it's very expensive to run. Yeah. The way it run, it's expensive because the drivers are expensive. Got it. With expensive drivers, so the wait time or the... the, the they, there's not that many buses. You have Got to wait it. for five minutes. If you have autonomous bus, ah. imagine with only, say, 10 seats or five seats. Right. Then you can you can go 
every minute. Wow. So you might have more buses. You have more buses. Because yeah. you don't need more drivers. So you have three buses for everyone that exists now. And instead of them running only half time, they run 24 hours a day. Uh, or they just sit there and wait for somebody. And then when they get on, then it starts taking them. Then ridership will go up. It would be more convenient. And, and it will also be more energy efficient. Yeah. Uh, that makes total sense. Why is this not open source? And is there an open source movement for self-driving yet? Because I count a lot of open source source technology is part of the framework of this, right? A lot of this is built on top of Linux, et cetera. But there don't seem to be open databases of all of the maps out there and all the real world data or the algorithms. Is it too complex to be open source? Is it require too much data to be open source? Or is just nobody decided to do that yet? Or I do so. I, is there an open source project that's got any kind of traction? I think they're definitely open sourced yeah. out there. But the thing that the system is so complicated mm. and uh, also it's so mission critical at this stage. Mm. Uh, so so mostly it's everyone is trying to develop it. I think at certain stage, at certain time, there might be open sourced version. But I, I think at this time, they're put too much emphasize on safety. Say, say for example, there's an a open source platform and there's accidents. Who's, who's responsible right. for it? Yeah, it's the same thing with databases right now. If you use open source database, the person who implemented it would be responsible, right? But a database isn't necessarily going to kill somebody. Exactly. So. so that does make it slightly more complicated. Would this be moving faster if it was an open source project or there were more open source initiatives, do you think? Or is it move faster with venture money and closed systems? I guess it not, seems not, like a lot of duplicate work, right, is going on. There are not, not in, enough data for me to make that assessment yet. Right. But I think at least from Pony's point of view, yeah. where we're making very fast execution. As, yeah. as the video have shown that we were yeah. a, already able to handle very complicated urban scenarios. Um, but just based on simple... Uh, just if, if it were just based on uh, open source initiative, I don't know if it can be this fast. Uh, when we get back from this final break, I want to talk about speed. It would make sense that cars, and we've seen this concept before with adaptive cruise control, there was a concept that at some point we would be having the cars in the left lane go into a train and be able to go 100 miles an hour, 125 miles an hour, and only be two car lengths between them, and the computers would get it all perfect, and we would see speeds increase on the highway. What I want to know from you, based on your experiences, would you put your family, would you put yourself in 10 years in self-driving cars that were going over 100 miles per hour on safe roads when we get back on This Week in Startups? Scaling sales is so hard, you know that, but it's so essential. You need to scale your sales process, your team, and of course your software. You know Salesforce is the world's number one customer relationship management platform, also known as CRM. And now with Salesforce Essentials, you get easy, out-of-the-box tools and support at a startup price point, and that's critical. Here are the benefits. You're going to get set up instantly and you can easily scale your sales team by customizing with clicks. You don't need to write any code. You will get simple integrations that connect and integrate all of your data under one roof, and you'll have full cycle customer support. So you can automatically connect multiple support channels. You'll be able to automate busy work and repetitive tasks so you're not wasting your time, and customers can help themselves, of course, with a self-service support site. Everything you need is on one screen, so you can track emails, calls, and meetings from your inbox. Get access to the world's number one CRM at a cost fit for a startup. Go to salesforce.com slash twist, and you will get a 50% discount with an annual contract, and you'll also get a free onboarding training session. Once again, that URL, salesforce.com slash twist for 50% off. All right, welcome back. My guest, James Pang, uh, he is the co-founder and CEO of Pony.ai. He's competing with the likes of Cruise, which is owned by GM. I hear they're very far behind. Is that true? They're not, the furthest not, behind? Not really. <laughs> Tesla. <laughs> Waymo. Who else has got a major? Baidu has an initiative? Yeah, it has one. It has one. Mm -hmm. Apple doesn't have one now? 
or does? It still has one. I Titan is still going on. I think so. But are they committed to it or not? What I, do you think? I don't know. I think they are committed. It's, it's such an important market that... Who did I miss? Cruise, Tesla, Waymo, Baidu, Titan at Apple, yourself, Pony. Who else has got a major initiative? Aurora. Aurora, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and who else? Mm. Major, yeah, major ones. Neuro. Neuro is another one. Mm -hmm. So we've listed now major one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight players uh, here. It's getting a bit crowded. I was asking you before about um, is everybody going to get there around the same time? Because everybody I've had on the program talking about it says three to five years, we could probably do it in a controlled environment. And everybody says level four, more like 10 years. Do you agree with the 10 year kind of for level four or five, or you think that's too far out? I think level five probably still going to take a, take a while. You, you, any, level, any come. level four, San Francisco, New York, Beijing, you think that's 10, seven to 10? Could be could be faster, but but five five to seven. Five to seven, great. So the range of when these start showing up on streets is three to seven years. If things go slower, maybe it's five to ten, but it's coming in the next ten years. What's it going to look like on a business basis? Will the person who makes the cars and the technology, like Tesla and Cruise, win, or like an existing GM, which are, GM owns Cruise, yeah? Uh, Will they win, or do you think it's going to be a new product, like maybe if you make your own car at some point, um, or Waymo is going to make their own cars, or Waymo put it onto other cars and they also had their own car. They put on other. They, they, they I think they. They stopped, their, stop making their own car. They stopped making their own cars. Do you think you're going to make your own car? Or is that not a good idea? Does it have probably to? Probably not. Probably not. You don't have to. You don't have to. The existing cars are good. Yeah, they're very good. So what's the What's this business going to look like in five years? Is it going to be a free-for-all with just everybody, like the scooters, where they're just flooding cities with cars and there'll be scooters and bikes everywhere? I think the whole mobility market, the industry is big enough. It certainly has the room for, for multiple companies to thrive. Yeah. Uh, but who's going to win and who's going to lose out? Only time can tell. Yeah. And there'll be some people like Tesla, which want to own their own fleet and make the cars. And then there'll be people like Uber and Lyft, where Uber has its own program. Um, and Lyft doesn't have a program, right? So you would be selling into Lyft. I think more like a collaborating. Collaborating. Ah, so you would maybe go after a city together. What about speed? When we left you on that last break, I was wondering, would you put your family in self-driving cars seven years from now going over 100 miles an hour? Is this going to make cars go faster on highways? I think totally. Um I think I, I have a, a 12, 10 year old, 12 and 10 year old daughters. Yeah. Uh, I think by they, when they grow up, they probably don't need to get their own driver license. They won't have it. They don't, they don't need to. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, what about speed? Because these things are so safe. And the thing that kills people in speed is human reaction at speed is terrible, right? But a computer's reaction at high speed would be much better. Is that correct? Definitely. So a human trying to hit the brake, a human can only see so far down the road. A computer could see further, correct? That's right. And it could mm. see through the car in front of it and to a certain extent through the windshield, probably a little better than an average human. So do we think that speeds will increase on highways because of this and that will make commutes and real estate further out from cities more viable? Uh, I think at least the uh, on the highways, mm. uh, on some dedicated lane, there per could be the cases where owning autonomous driving vehicles are allowed and they can be driven in much faster speed. Right. Because it's safer. It's... So we just say, you know what, the left speed, the, the HOV lane is now the self-driving lane. If you have level three or four, you go in that lane and you go 85, something slightly faster, maybe even 100. What do you think the proper speed will be in 10, 20 years? 
Well, that that will depends on the straight highway safety levels at that time. But but definitely the scenarios you just described totally is feasible. Yeah, because we already have. I think they've raised the highway speed in some long straight roads in America to eighty five, like in Nevada and stuff like that. So it seems to me that people will start driving a hundred miles an hour, and that will make certain commutes more viable. And with electric cars, you're not going to be worrying about polluting as much.、Um, What's the Chinese government's involvement in all of this, and and how does that impact the pace? I've heard people say China is going to get there before America, because the Chinese government can,、um, with eminent domain or you know with regulations, move much faster. When you want to build a bridge or a highway, they do it overnight or seemingly in a weekend in China because they don't have a lot of regulations and the government has a lot more authority to do so. Is it going to arrive much faster in China? And also, they have the need. So, is it going to be? It's hard to tell. I mean, one, even in the U.S., certain things when when we put the mines in there, certain things move very fast as well, right? Yeah. When, when the Empire State Building was being built, it was built two days a story as well. So, yeah. So, I think it's it's just the the will of the people and and how we move the. So, so I think it's still too early to tell. You're Chinese. I was. Yeah. yeah. Who has more will right now today, the Chinese entrepreneurs or the American? In your experience, I think both. Both、uh, we definitely see the wills and the, the hard work and, and the, the the strong vision in, on both sides. Yeah. What do you think of the nine nine six culture in China? That, that it seems people work much harder in China than America today, and people in America work much harder than in Europe. I think、uh, the numbers show. Is it? Healthy to work that hard, and is it something that should be criticized, or should it be something that is celebrated? The work ethic in China、um, and technology today. My personal view, I take a very neutral view on、uh, this. I think it's a、uh, if it's forced, it's probably something needs to be criticized. But but it's a choice, right? If it's a choice, then I think it should be celebrated. I mean, I I just love my work. There's nothing、yeah. wrong with work. Works sixty hours, seventy hours a, a, a week, right? Yeah, yeah. It just seems to be the standard in China. Well, at least not in our company. Not in your company. <laughs> you let people make that decision.、Yeah. Uh, and the engineers, America versus China. Do you see a difference? Similarities. We we definitely see.、Uh, both countries have a great engineers. Yeah. Have a、uh, great researchers.、Mm. Uh, Engineers in in the valleys still, with several with many many years of of、uh, accumulation, it's definitely more experienced. Right, because they've worked at a Google or a Facebook, and the number of people that have worked at a Baidu is smaller. Even look at the Google. Google. What made Google so great is all the engineers used to work at some other companies. Yeah, some S- Microsoft. SDIs, yeah, some Microsoft. Yeah, right. Some. Microsystems and、yeah. all these great companies, right?、Build、HP. Build on each other. Build, they build on each other. So it's the whole ecosystem that that train the mind side of the engineers、yeah. and the researchers. It's very, it's very interesting to have a Chinese. You American citizen now too? Yeah. Oh wow! Congratulations. Oh, thank you. When did you become a citizen? Well, many many years ago. Many years ago. <laughs> Congratulations! Wow, but you go back on a regular basis. You have employees in both places. So yes. It's nice to see. The deep collaboration of the countries and you having employees in both places, you're the you're the vote for engagement. Engagement between our countries is good. You believe? I think yeah. so. Yeah, I, th- I think collaborating, engaging,、uh, understanding each other is is always good. Yeah. What is it that Americans don't understand about China? What are, what should we understand? And what do the Chinese not understand about America I, that I, they should understand more of? I think the mutual sides understand each each other a lot more than than used to be. When I first came to this country about twenty twenty something years ago,、uh, the, the, we I knew very little about the country. But I think these days, when people start growing up, the the younger generations they actually knew each other, all, all the the culture and the 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 things going on in each side is a lot better than we used to be, and、yeah. I think that leads to a lot, a lot of、uh, great things. I think what's going to solve this whole problem, movies. 
I think the fact that we're going to share all the Marvel characters and Star Wars and Mission Impossible and Alibaba funding Tom Cruise movies, I know it sounds silly, but if you share those stories and uh, Americans started to understand some of the stories from China and some of the folklore and some of the characters, if we share that, you start to share like a mythology and heroes and villains and common ground. So if you meet each other and you both know who Iron Man is, or you both know, I mean, Bruce Lee was an incredible ambassador, right, for uh, Asian culture. Um, and you, you think about how revered martial arts became in the United States. It's very interesting um, how that part of the culture is now mm. bleeding over. I was just in Hong Kong, and my book got translated to Chinese right there. Oh, wow. What does it say on the cover? Rich man's mindset. Rich man's mindset. <laughs> right? That's what it says, yeah. Yeah. They renamed my book Angel into the rich man's mindset. Uh, yeah. I'm now wow. getting emails wow. nice. from people in China who have read the book. And they say, I'm in China, I'm in Beijing, I'm in Shanghai, I want to be what, an what angel. When can I get an autographed paper Well, book. you just take that one off the wall and I'll sign it for you. The first time I've ever signed it, you have to show me how to write Jason in Chinese. All right, listen, this has been great. Let's recap. Sure. You would put your kids in a 100 mile per hour car 10 years from now, racing down the 280. You feel that confident about it. Uh, if you want to work 996, and you opt into it, that's your choice. Mazel tov, that's good for you. Uh, you're not gonna make the cars, you're gonna sell the technology to other people. And level three, level four, we're ready to go. We'll have it in Mountain View or Palo Alto in the next three to five years, no problem, easy peasy. And then in San Francisco and Beijing and Guangzhou, as soon as maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. Uh, congratulations, James, on the funding, becoming a unicorn. And uh, yeah, get it done. Well, thank, thank you, Jason. I, I am, I'll take your good words. I am sitting in traffic with my autopilot on, looking at my phone going, oh my Lord, I could recapture this 20 minute commute and I could be watching the game instead of just listening to it. All right. No, you should listen to your podcast. Listening to podcasts, exactly, <laughs> absolutely. All right, we'll see everybody next time on The Swinging Service. Bye-bye.